All right. Yeah. Um, also, glad to be here at the family. It was really, um, I mean, uh, we hosted our first platform conference just a couple months ago here in Berlin at the Kraftwerk. Uh, it was a, we had 1,500 people around that. Uh, at the conference, we talked about the platform economy here in Europe. We try, as Solando now, to also push platform thinking into the European mindset because we all believe that Companies like Facebook, Google, Amazon, Alibaba, they are all not coming from Europe and we need stronger companies like that also here in Europe and we also believe that Zalando could be one of those companies in the future, um, but many, many more. And um, it was really great to get in touch with the guys from the family um, and especially with Alice. Um, she spoke about the different tech hubs all over the world with us on stage. And um, yeah, she then, uh, after we had a great talk later, um, she then said I should uh, talk here. So I will, as, I, as, as Hugo already said, I was with Zalando for six and a half years. So I've seen a lot uh, and I could talk a lot about it. Since I'm leaving the company in two days, um, I could actually talk very honestly about everything uh, because there are no ma not many restrictions uh, applying to me. Um, but uh, I tried to assemble a few anecdotes over those past years, from those past years. Um, we'll have a longer Q&A afterwards, so you will be free to ask whatever you want, and uh, I, I will be happy to answer almost every question regarding Zalando. Um, but yeah, so let's get started. So when I joined Zalando in, there was like end of 2010, beginning of 2011, I had a five minute interview back then. So a friend of mine uh, actually, um, a kindergarten friend of mine just uh, started at Solando and he, we had a nice talk about logistics um, over the Christmas days and then he said like, hey, when you're back in Berlin, come by and swing by in our office in Sonnenburger Straße in Prenzlauer Berg here in Berlin and um, I stopped by. And he then said, okay, I'm gonna, show, uh, I'm gonna introduce you to uh, one of our uh, CEOs here at Solando, that's Ruben Ritter and he would like to talk to you. And so I got into a room with him and he said like, okay, when can you start? And um, yeah, I said like, okay, I'm actually right now a freelancer, so I could start whenever you want to. He said like, okay, let's do it for one month. So he gave me a one month contract, um, typical startup style, of course. And um, yeah, that was my first meeting room. It was a Plattenbau, so those really ugly um, apartment buildings that they have here in uh, Berlin still around. Um, the building itself of Zalando at that time looked very fancy, but I had to go and pass through many, many hallways and then I ended up in this uh, Plattenbau. Um, the dust was actually like five centimeters high uh, in it and um, there was a ping pong table in it before. Um, great location to start uh, a new project. Um, and But again, I would love to step back a little bit now and talk a little bit about Zalando before my uh, entrance into that company. So who has, who knows about Zalando here in this room? Who doesn't know about Zalando yet? One, two, okay. Who has ordered at Zalando? Also good, good. Okay, I just got my last package um, a few minutes ago um, for, for my time at Zalando and um, so Okay, so that was our first business case at Zalando. Just to give you some ideas. That was really the first business case in the summer of 2008. So 2008 was a very special summer in, Ger in Germany because it was actually hot. So as, as Hugo said, like four months of nice weather in Berlin is quite not, it's not true. Um, you <laughs> will get to know it's like one month, maybe, maximum. And that was a very hot summer and uh, Robert and David, our founders at Zalando, they decided to build their first company here in Germany. Before they actually started the company in Germany, they actually went to Latin America because they believed it would be much cooler to build a company in Latin America. There was supposed to be a social network at that time uh, Facebook was uh, kicking off and they believed they could be a competitor to Facebook in Latin America. Of course, that, that didn't work and they got back to Berlin and uh, tried to build something sustainable. And yeah, that was the, the business case. So they, they expected sales to be at about 76 million within the first five years at Zalando. 
to me i i founded my first company um when when i got out of high school i never had expectations to have a company that would be like, would make like 76 million in revenue does any one of you know what Zalando made in revenue in 2013 what do you guys think any any ideas come on kevin 120 million yeah uh, we got a little bigger uh, than that so in 2013 we were at 1.8 billion um, that was the revenue of the last five years um, so now we're about 3.6 billion in revenue we will sh overshoot the the 4 billion in 2000 six uh, seventeen now uh, for sure you can also see the EBIT margin so the profitability of the company so what you will all uh, if you want to become an entrepreneur you will get to know the German mindset that a company needs to be profitable very very early um, but if you look at many uh, US companies especially if you look at Amazon you see that profitability should not be the key focus of your business in the beginning if you are well funded and we were well well funded to be honest um, we had great investors from the very early start and um, just to see like in 2013 we were still in the in the red with 110 million in uh, uh, in losses um, but right now for example 2016 we made profits of about 216 million so like four to five percent uh, EBIT margin um, overall um, that was the first team of Zalando um, there was six weeks after the company was launched you can see Robert, our founder in the center, and David on the right. Um, and um, yeah, there was a very special day. You can also see Nikki uh, in, the, in, the, in the front. Uh, she's, uh, she's now the executive assistant of the management board. Um, back then, when she was hired, she was employee number one. Her job back then was head of HR, head of organization, head of infrastructure, head of finance, head of accounting, controlling, basically of everything, um, except online marketing, I think, um, at that time. Uh, you can also see Christoph Lange. He was our first tech guy. He's now uh, vice president brand solutions at Zalando. And uh, you can see the one person why we took that picture at that time. You can see the, the, the Zalando parcels on the far right. And, um, but the reason why we took that picture was the guy in the center with the yellow jacket. The Germans here might know who that could be. Where's he, for, for which company is that guy working? DHL, yes. That's the post guy. Because, I mean, that was the shared apartment that we had as a first um, office at Torstraße. I think Torstraße, you all know, the center of Berlin, like Od Neue Odessa Bar and all the Kitty Cheng and all the party places, but actually Zalando was built there. And um, until then, every evening, we had to take all our parcels and walk to the post office at Torstraße and send them out over that, uh, through that uh, post office. And that was uh, the day when the post office actually said like, okay guys, this is not gonna, we, gonna, we can't take this anymore. We're gonna send somebody over who's gonna pick up all the parcels at your um, office location. And that was uh, like six weeks after we launched the company. Um, some of the others uh, were like um, uh, interns, of course, in the, in the beginning. And yeah, it was a crazy time at that time. Um, but yeah, okay, there was a little going back in time, but now that's the time when I, when I joined Zalando. So my first job um, at Zalando, when, when we came to that uh, office building in Prenzlauer Berg, Sonnenburger Straße, does any one of you know that uh, office building? Because yeah, there are like uh, companies uh, such as Glispa, Movinga, and so on. They are all in that building right now. It's a, it's a former electricity station. And it was really crazy. I mean, it's like 10,000 square meters big. And right before I joined, um, as I said, my kindergarten uh, friend also joined Zalando and Ruben told him, like, don't worry about office space at Zalando. We have now a 10,000 square, uh, square meter office building here, Sonnenburger Straße. It's gonna last for at least five years. We can become like a thousand Zalandos in it and it's gonna last forever. Six months later, we had to find a new office building because it was too small. Um, at that time, we started hiring 250 people per month. 
um, and it was really insane. Like it was like every day was a welcome day. So every day there were new people starting at the company. You had um, our head of infrastructure, Andreas Polke, was the poorest guy on earth. He worked for Siemens before, and I think he couldn't imagine working for something like Zalando before uh, ever in his life. And so he was standing there just in the morning, and he had to hand out a chair, a table, and a computer. And then you were lucky if you would find a spot to actually work. Um, some people ended up on the floor for a couple days because there were not enough chairs and usually not enough space. That was the floor where all the international markets were launched. So um, at Zalando, you can see if in terms of mentality, one thing we we looked always at everything very closely in the beginning. And when, once we understood the matrix behind it, we then scaled it very, very quickly. And uh, we did the same for Zalando. So the first two years, we basically didn't do anything else but Germany and shoes. Once we understood how the Germans buy shoes online, then we said, okay, we can now scale it to other markets. We can scale it to other assortment categories and we can scale uh, other business models as well. So that's what, that's what happened in 2011. There were hundreds of new people starting all the time and especially international people from all over the world were, were coming to Zalando. And yeah, as I said, that was also the time when I started. Um, so my, um, when I joined, I had one job. Before th before I joined, first of all, I, I never studied. Um, I, wor I, I founded my first company right after high school. It was a temp agency, so staffing uh, for other companies and headhunting and all of those th things. And um, then I worked in the event business here in Europe a lot and I was also for a short time in a startup here in Berlin. Then I got to Zalando and the first thing I was supposed to do was to find the location for the first warehouse of Zalando. I've never had anything to do with a warehouse or with logistics before, um, but they assigned me a job to say like, okay, we now know uh, Zalando needs to grow much faster, even faster than we, d we were doing at that time. And um, I had the job to find the location for the perfect, uh, for the first warehouse. I had to find uh, the, the right outfit of that uh, warehouse, how much would it cost and how soon could we start working in it. Um, so to take it back, that was our first logistics center. That was the back of our shared apartment in Torstrasse. Uh, you can see the, the first um, employee for logistics had to be very small uh, to fit through the different uh, parts of the, of the building. Um, then <coughs> we, because we in the beginning said, okay, let's concentrate on the core competences of Zalando, which were mostly online marketing and, and buying shoes. Um, but actually logistics for a Berlin startup, that was nothing that we had on our radar. So we gave it out. We, we outsourced uh, the logistics. We gave it to Dokdata uh, from the Netherlands. Um, they were specialized in e-commerce and fashion at that time. And they tried to cope with our, uh, with our growth. But at that time, we could already see that the way we were growing, so you can imagine like in the beginning of 2010, we were making 4 million in uh, net revenue a month. At Within like, I think, five months, we were making like 60 to 70 million a month. So the growth was just insane at that time. So we launched our first TV campaigns, that which most of you know, um, and, and all of that. And TV really kicked off uh, the entire um, business model like crazy. And it became like a, a, um, uh, a big problem that, my, that possibly our ca uh, capacities and logistics would not suit, to our, to our, uh, suit our, our growth anymore. And so that's why we had to find a solution for that. And um, so we, we thought about three ways. First, we need to make sure that Dokdata is actually coping with our, our growth at the time. We need, second, we need to find a location like a first location to start our own logistics from scratch, which was Brieselang. Uh, we still have that location outside of Berlin. We used a former um, logistics center um, by Karstadt um, to, to use that location for our own uh, use. And at the same time, my team was building the first self-designed uh, warehouse, which we would be able to start uh, working in a year later. And um, 
That was, for example, our um, VG, uh, so shared apartment uh, that we then took over once we decided on the city of Erfurt in the very center of uh, Germany to, s to start like concentrating on the German customer in the beginning and making sure that the delivery times are very, very fast and, and working out. We, um, to make sure that we actually start in that city as well and not, be, uh, not to have Erfurt like as a satellite city for Zalando, but rather have, uh, have Erfurt uh, to become a core part of Zalando, we said, okay, we actually have to move to, to Erfurt. So we took that shared apartment in Erfurt and started uh, working on everything there. Um, you see, um, at that time, uh, yeah, uh, funding was not that high for the uh, shared apartment and it was very basic, um, but uh, we, we did everything uh, there. Uh, we then had a very good um, kickoff um, at the founding day of that location. So, so that's Ruben, our then uh, also co-CEO. You have David Schröder on the far left and my team, Stefan and Ro uh, Robert, uh, on the right. And um, so, yeah, we um, that was the day of the opening of Erfurt, then a, a year later, and that's actually how it looks like. Um, so we now employ about 3,000 people in that location itself. It's the, we are the biggest uh, and largest uh, employer of the city. Uh, we might actually become the largest employer of, this, of the entire state uh, in central Germany. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an insane story, but to go back, the decision for that is just the amazing thing, to be, uh, to be honest, to, uh, from, from my perspective. Because to actually build something like that, the invest for Zalando would be around 170 million euros in invest. So if you think about the, the year before, uh, we actually had 150 million in net revenue. And then we, as a, as a group of people who have never done anything in logistics before, we, decide, we said like, okay, if we want to do it ourselves, we have to invest 170 million, we have to build a logistics center ourselves, we have to employ like minimum 500 people in there, which we never did before. And um, so that way we actually got to a point where usually I think nobody would give us that kind of money uh, to, uh, to invest in it. If we would have gone to our investors at that time and said, okay, we take 170 million from our funding and just invest it in one logistics center, which we would start working in a, a year and a half later, I think that's a very insane uh, situation. But we thought through the, the, in the entire case very, very easily. And um, we also decided on several steps that we could take and measures that we could take over the next couple of months then. And we suggested it to our investors. And at that time, Rocket Internet, um, you, you might know the, the Samba brothers, um, were still our largest shareholders. They, they had about 50% of Zalando at that time. And, um, and the Samba brothers then we, we suggested that kind of idea to build our own uh, logistics center. They had some great questions about it. Uh, we especially discussed it with Alex Zamba, um, one of the brothers. And um, he said, he had, as I said, like a few remarks on it. We had to discuss it with him back and forth a little bit. But after a short while, he said like, okay, I like it. It's okay, we can do it. Um, I will talk uh, to all the investors. And a day later, he called back and said, I talked to all the investors, it's fine, you can go ahead. And I think that's also what uh, reflects on why at that time it was great to have partners like, uh, like the Samba brothers at that time uh, helping us in that moment, uh, because I, th I don't think a German company would usually have the funding to do such a step. Um, but it actually worked out very, very well. Um, we still took it very, very, um, let's say, cautious. We had several steps during the process where we could have always pulled the plug and we also secured great funding from the state. We had great funding from several banks. So we actually had the Sparkasse Mittel Thüringen, one of the most conservative banking uh, systems you can have here in Germany. They actually helped us with a 40 uh, million debt funding um, for that location. So in the end, we ended up not even using our own cash reserves uh, in the beginning for that location at all because we had such a great planning uh, for, uh, for it. Um, now, just to give an impression, we have four of those locations in Germany. Um, we have Brieselang, we have 
Erfurt, we have Mönchengladbach, we have La, and we are just about to open up our first one in Poland as well. We have new logistics center in Italy, France, and Sweden is going to be opened up uh, during that year as well. So it's the, the logistics footprint of uh, Zalando just exploded. When I joined, we had like five people working in logistics. Now there are about, about 8,000 uh, working in logistics. So Zalando itself has about 13,000 employees at that time. And uh, it's still growing like crazy. And I believe like in the next two years, we'll hit the 20,000 employees uh, very easily. Um, so at that same time, my job also changed because as I said, I was responsible for that project in the beginning. I was also responsible for the next search process to our second warehouse in, in Mönchengladbach. But um, we became very, we had some issues with the press. I don't know, has any of you uh, read or seen the negative coverage on logistics, especially of Zalando in the past? Yeah? S a few, okay. Um, so as you can imagine, building up such a logistics team in the beginning and especially with um, with Erfurt where we hired 1,200 people within the first six months, most of them from long-term unemployment, it was a huge like, risk that we took and we knew that there were people like also leaving that, uh, that team very, very soon and so on and so on and so we knew there would be negative things about it. And uh, then my job role then changed and I became head of communications because we were starting to get into the negative press and we then had to start to regain the trust of journalists because as most of you will see here in uh, Berlin, a lot of startups don't like to do corporate PR in the beginning. They try to stay under the radar, which worked out also for Zalando for a very long time very successfully because our competitors didn't know about our growth and so on. But we also didn't expect the 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 outside appearance of Zalando at that time uh, to be that critical. Um, the connection with Rocket Internet was very critical, but also, of course, all the, the, the discussions about warehouse conditions were always a big issue. So um, when I joined uh, or when I started the corporate communications team, I hired uh, two, two great girls. Um, Christine and Caro, you can see here in the front, um, they're still with, uh, with the team uh, uh, as of today. And um, they just also started at, uh, like Caro just uh, came right from university and uh, Christine started as a working student at Zalando before, but in the fashion PR, which is not that sensible, I would say, as uh, perhaps corporate comms. And um, so we, we then decided to invite all the journalists that are relevant to us and we did, we did, for example, on this, in this case, we did a huge tour. We took David Schröder, the Senior Vice President Operations, or COO of Zalando, um, and we took the, uh, like, I think four or five editors from all over Europe with us, and we then did a huge trip with a, with a car from our former location with Doc Data uh, in, uh, in Großbeeren, near Berlin. Then we went to Brieselang, and then we went to Erfurt and we showed them also how the logistics have evolved in those in that short amount of time. And it was, as I said, all about regaining the trust. And I would say right now um, that has uh, worked very, very well. Uh, you can see the financial, uh, the, the, the press coverage at that time. When you look at the Financial Times, Zalando defends work practices after undercover TV probe. Um, you can, I don't know if you've seen that, there was like a huge campaign by RTL, um, a German TV station, um, where an undercover journalist was for six weeks in our logistics center and she then showed that TV material all over the place and it was really a big shitstorm. I was right in the center of that. I did one post on the Facebook page of uh, Zalando at like 3 a.m. Uh, in the morning um, to defend us in that logistics and it worked out very horribly. I never used that account again. Um, <laughs> but I still have it. It's, I, I don't know if they understand that they should take away my right to use it uh, on, my, on my smartphone. But uh, anyway, and then, um, but you cannot imagine, I mean, at the same time as this was airing, I think five days before that, we had our kickoff event for our IPO. So we were just on the path to launch, like we hired the banks, we hired the um, legal advisors, we hired the communications uh, agency that would help me. And um, 
so right at that time we had such a big shitstorm. Not great. But um, to be honest, you can also see that in the end it worked out very, very well because we managed that shitstorm, I think, good and in a good manner. We were very transparent, very open. We discussed it. We let in every journalist into the warehouse. We showed them what was happening there. They could talk to the employees. They could see there's nothing unhuman work, uh, happening there. There are like things that are not working out, but still that's a very young team and there are things uh, not going right, but we are improving every day. And um, at the same time, we were of course starting to launch initiatives to shape also our picture in the US media. That was um, in the Forbes in Forbes magazine. Then just a couple months, like July 30th, uh, we had the big story about Solando in Forbes magazine. Just to give you also some impression about journalists in Europe, I would always say like because people here always believe journalists in the U.S. are far worse than the one in Europe. I can tell you, work with journalists from Forbes magazine or New York Times. Their ethics about journalism are insane. They, t I mean. I had to work with the guy from uh, from Forbes like for six months. Every month we had an interview about what's happening in Zalando. He checked everything back and forth, back and forth, until he then said, okay, I'm going to do a story about Zalando. The same with New York Times. I think I worked on New York Times for, at, I think, at least three and a half years until they finally published something for us. And that's not really comparable to, uh, to the German or European um, uh, scene here. Um, but as I said, I think in the end it all worked out very, very well. Um, we had a very great um, uh, IPO in October 2014. We started with an evaluation of about like 5 billion. Uh, we're now at an uh, evaluation of like 10 billion um, on the stock market here in, uh, in, in Frankfurt. We had a great party. We actually got confetti on the, on the floor at the stock exchange, which is not usual. And I can tell you, the head of security of uh, the Frankfurt Stock Exchange, he looks way worse than the one that you always meet at Berghain. Um, and uh, it was, they, I mean, you can see the guys from the, um, the analysts that were standing there, they really thought it was a terrorist attack um, until they realized it was just confetti. And we invited all the employees of Zalando of the first six months, so from 2009. Um, those people were all invited and you can see them in the front with the cannons, uh, with the confetti cannons. We also introduced, um, we like 4,000 Zalandos at that time became Zalando uh, shareholders because we had a big program to also have all Zalando employees become uh, shareholders within the company. Um, we didn't like Frankfurt that much, to be honest, because it's not a city for Zalando like that. And we decided to go back, uh, take the train, drive back to, um, uh, to Berlin and have a big party in Berlin. So that was the deal team um, at that time. Uh, so the deal team are the ones that are like the most responsible ones for the IPO. You have the sen senior vice president finance, Jan Kemper, in the center. You have our general counsel, Michael Menz, on the far right. And you have head of investor relations, Birgit, uh, in, the, in the down right. Um, those are like the key key persons that you use during the IPO. And just to give you some impression, um, Michael worked for Freshfields lawyers for 10 years. He did like IPOs all the time. Birgit worked for um, Goldman Sachs for 10 years, in especially in Silicon Valley, doing doing IPOs all the time. Jan uh, did IPOs while, while he was working in various banks and Morgan Stanley and so on uh, before. And there was me, who had never heard of IPOs before. Um, I really felt small in that group, um, but it was a lot of fun. I mean, it was an insane ride. Um, and uh, yeah, now Jan is the one who just left Zalando and is becoming the youngest uh, CFO of a DAX company in Germany now at Pro7 Sat1 in Munich. And I'm following him. That's why I'm leaving Zalando and also going to Pro7 Sat1 in Munich. And Birgit as head of corporate uh, finance is now moving up uh, and uh, she just turn, uh, became the first uh, senior vice president uh, finance uh, at Zalando. She just, at the same time when she was promoted, she also got her first child um, and took off like six months after that. And now she's finally on, on, the, on the job. But um, yeah, that's also a great story. And um, after we got back to Berlin, 
I uh, rented uh, the Avenue Club. I don't know if you've uh, been there at uh, Karl Marx Straße. Um, and uh, we had a big Zalando party. Everybody was invited. We had a great, uh, great time. I took that pictures, a picture of the three CEOs at like four o'clock in the morning. You can see they were really relieved. Of course, they also um, were very happy because the, the share price was good at that time. But we all didn't really took attention to the share price at the day itself because it crashed very heavily. And in the next morning, uh, Ruben actually wrote a great um, post to everybody at Zalando saying like, okay, you know what, please do not look at the share price from day to day because it doesn't make sense. The company hasn't changed since yesterday um, and it will not change uh, just like that tomorrow. But uh, look at it from the long term. And you can imagine, I mean, we started with 24 euros uh, as a share price on the initial day. Um, now we are at about 40 euros and um, still growing in that sense. Um, I think what's important then to also understand what I found extremely interesting at that time, because usually if you go to do an IPO, the negative side after that is usually that, become that you become very corporate. You you have to report your numbers on a quarterly basis. You have to um, do AGMs. You have to do a lot of stuff that you didn't have to do in the uh, uh, before. And um, so I found it very cool of that company to say like, okay, we're going to switch the entire business model after the IPO, which is something that usually other companies would not be able to do on in such a new um, setup. Um, but we, we turned around from just a classic online shop to become a fashion platform. So we now introduced a lot of B2B uh, processes for Zalando. We introduced new pro uh, products to also bring in influencers and bloggers on the scene. We are uh, doing our own labels. For example, I think, I don't know if you know it, but Zalando is also uh, one of the heaviest, uh, one, one of the biggest fashion employers here in uh, Berlin. We have 19 private labels of Zalando making about 400 million in uh, revenue a year already um so also in that kind of sense uh, quickly growing and but still i mean we of course had to do some of those uh, things there was the first agm uh, so the jahreshauptversammlung as you say in germany um really horrible meeting um but you can see there also the character of the three guys i would always say uh, the whole time you can see that david is looking like okay what the fuck is going on but uh, just smile and uh, stay through it. Robert is looking somewhere else because he thinks this is not what I signed up for. And Ruben, uh, as the finance guy, he thinks this is the greatest day of his life. <laughs> He's really enjoying it every time. It's unbelievable. Um, anyway, um, so I think uh, to say it uh, in that kind of sense, um, I think that was it from me in the beginning. And I'm ho ha happy to have some uh, questions and answer some questions from you guys now. Thank you very much. Thanks, crazy story. So I think Lou is going to oh, well hand out. Okay. Change. Yeah, Perfect. Change. Yes. And who's got a question? Don't be shy. Hi. Well, what made Zalando grow so fast and what is the advantage? Because there was also Amazon, I think, and other mm -hmm. e-commerce platforms. Yeah. Um, so in general, I think there are like many, many different reasons, of course. Um, three core reasons, I would always say like four core reasons. Uh, one was the timing. So I think 2008, 2009 was perfect to build a company because it was the financial crisis. Um, I think um, everybody, there, there was not a lot of money in the market. People were not spoiled at that time. People were really desperate to work and really wanted to do something. And um, so I think from a ter in terms of mindset, it helped the company very much to be very uh, frugal and, and not, not spending too much money in the beginning. So it was really like, of course, everybody here in Berlin always said like, yeah, Zalando is spending so much money and so on and so on. But in, in general, when you looked at Zalando, the the money was spent very, very wisely on very, very effectively. And that's what investors always loved about us, that we always hit the points, whatever we, s we, th we said that we would do, we did it and we overshot it always. So I think like timing was, was great. Second was the people. 
Um, I, I don't think that there has been ever a situation where in Germany you had the combination of so many great talents at the same time working together in such a close relationship because they were all coming from the same school. They all came from that same, almost like within, I think, three years of that school, they all came, like the most important people in the company still today all came from that group. And so the trust among the tom top management was insane. You really had like a guy like Christian Mehrmann who built the, the entire marketing team. He never did anything in marketing before. He just read a book about marketing like that uh, on the weekend and then he launched it and suddenly he had 500 people working in online marketing. And I think having that trust at that early stage was, was absolutely important. And all those people actually also delivered on it. I mean, right now, most of them are still in the senior uh, vice president position or vice president position in the company. And uh, that kind of stability um, was, was key. Um, and the third one was, of course, the mindset. Um, and I think with, with mindset, um, it's also something that you do not see all the time here in the startup scene. You see a lot of people wasting a lot of money and, 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 and saying like, okay, I have a great vision and I'm looking at that vision before I actually start working on it. And as, as Hugo already said, um, Berlin is very good at execution and we just concentrated on execution. We said like, okay, uh, we see something, um, we, we take five euros and invest it in online marketing. If that works out, if the conversion is good, then we invest 10 euros in it. That works out well, let's invest now 20 euros. And now let's make a bet and take 100,000 uh, euros and see what it, what it takes, uh, if it takes us there. So I think in that sense, always testing and uh, as soon as it works, then scaling very quickly, that was also key uh, to the success. And market advantage, like uh, what, what was your advantage compared to the competitors mm -hmm. and the developer position? Why did customers yeah. uh, adopted Zalando yeah. so fast? Um, I think in terms of like value proposition and, and customer proposition, we had um, a few advantages, of course. Um, first of all, the German market was very slow to adapt. Like the big players, like Otto, um, like um, at that time... There were others also like Karstadt, Neckermann, and so on. They all don't exist anymore. Um, only uh, Otto are the ones who have survived. Um, and also if you looked at, for example, ASOS, um, they were all very slow in their growth and also very slow in the way they adapted uh, to the markets and the local needs. And what we did at Zalando was we, we realized very quickly that the way, we work, uh, the way Germany worked out was very successful and it became a very quick success case. We then looked at something like Switzerland, where we had like I think four guys, all like at the age of like 24, looking at the case of Switzerland, saying, "Oh, that's really difficult. Nobody has ever cracked Switzerland before, because of the customs uh, situation that you have to pass every parcel through the customs." And suddenly they said, "Okay, let's talk to the custom uh, uh, authorities." We did so, and they said, okay, we can find another solution, and we did so, and now Switzerland is one of the key markets of Zalando, and, um, and nobody else has ever has yet adapted to it. And um, we did the same with France, where we looked at the French market from a different side and said, like, okay, what do, what do our customers want in France? And when you look at most of our competitors, also, for example, Amazon, they are the same thing all over the place. They don't adapt at all. They have the same payment, they have the same... Um, uh, delivery methods, they have the same um, design of the website everywhere. We had a different look of the website in every market. We had different SEO descriptions in all uh, markets. We had uh, different um, payment methods. For example, the people in uh, Italy, how, how do people in Italy uh, pay? What do you think? Cash. cash. Yeah, cash on delivery. It's insane. As, a, as an online company, that was completely mind-blowing for us. And we still, I mean, right now, more than 50% of all people in Italy pay cash at the door. And um, we had to find a process to actually make that work. Or people in France, um, I know the, we have some French people here, but um, people in France actually st still used checks, written checks. Yeah, sorry to say. <laughs> It was really unbelievable for us, but we had to find that solution. We always looked at the solution to make it work. And for each market, we found that like the, the Dutch with pay one uh, and so on, they all have their own payment methods and to adapt to it was, was key and also, uh, also have this, the look 
Like the French, for example, our, our, our uh, page, uh, like the web page in France, look completely different than in Germany. The Germans, what do you think they wanted? Structure. Search, assortment, that's it. That's how I go into my shop. The French were like, pictures, inspiration, everything like that. And then uh, maybe I buy. <laughs> uh, it was insane. Like, and you could see that. I mean, right now that has all, of course, changed because of mobile. In mobile, you have a completely different user journey, and you have completely different cases there. You have to find other niches uh, to make yourself uh, and dif differentiate yourself. Um, but yeah, I think like uh, in that kind of sense, but also like staying strong with our customer proposition. Of course, with free delivery and free returns. The Germans, until because they all, s everybody in the industry believed that Zalando with free returns would not never become profitable. We always said, like, don't worry about it. It's completely fine. We saw from our first customers on, we completely saw that it, this will become a very profitable business case. As soon as we would stop investing, it, be, it would turn very, very profitable. Um, but we actually don't want to stop investing. We actually rather want to keep investing and not become too profitable because then you get spoiled. And uh, that's what you don't want to have. Um, so I think like staying strong with our customer proposition until this day is one, one of the keys. And very, we believed in TV marketing at a time when all the startups here in Berlin said, no, you cannot measure it. We found a way to measure it for ourselves and uh, it became a huge success. I mean, everybody then tried to do media for equity, but of course then the market was gone and uh, nobody's making a lot of uh, good stuff with it anymore. Uh, adjusting to such a big growth is pretty uh, pretty difficult. So was there a time where the growth became so big that it um, started becoming dangerous for the company itself? Was there some point? Yeah, I always take the year 2013. Uh, that's a good uh, example as a year. Um, so until 2013, we were always growing like crazy. And at the same time, we were improving our profitability very, very well. Um, in 2013, things happened, which made us realize that the company has become now very, very big and too big, actually, uh, for our structure, for our internal structure, like the m management structure as well. So um, at the beginning of 2013, we thought first assumption was our awareness is high enough. So we do not need to spend so much money on marketing anymore. Second assumption was we're now so big, we can buy a lot in advance because we know how big we are and we can then, by buying it early, we save money and that will help us. Assumption three is we have now more capacity with the new warehouse kicking in in uh, Erfurt. So none of those three things worked out because our capacities in Erfurt didn't work out because the, there was the first logistics center, we had some, some issues in the beginning, and we were not able to, s to, to, um, to uh, um, send out that quickly. At the same time, something else happened in, the, uh, in, in, in Germany or in Europe. We suddenly had a very bad spring, which is also very common here, in, uh, especially in Germany. And um, so, so if you have a business model that completely relies on the weather, you could see that we suddenly had a lot of stuff for the summer season in our warehouse, but actually people were still buying um, pullovers and uh, sweaters and uh, jackets and jeans, and we only had bikinis in our in our uh, warehouse like that. And um, and at the same time, of course, customers got uh, unsatisfied with uh, the delivery speed and so on, and we didn't have so much marketing anymore. So suddenly, like everything we did was not working out at that time. And it was real big fuck up. We had big discussions about how have, do we have to change our governance? How do we have to change our, to make sure that our KPIs work out smoothly and that we take the right assumptions? And we took the learnings. And then in 2014, we became profitable actually because we took the learnings. We didn't go so much into pre-order. We did more in-season sales and uh, we did a lot um, yeah, uh, con mo way more control of how we spend marketing and uh, how we control our capacities. Perfect. Hi, uh, I'm Chmale. Uh, do you think Salando uh, wants to go to emerging markets like <coughs> Africa, 
Latin America. And do you think uh, a company with this scale of uh, logistics will be possible in countries where the infrastructure is limited? Yeah. Okay, so um, first of all, at the same time as Solando became very, very successful, the Samba Brothers and Rocket Internet launched their own clones of Zalando um, all over the world. So in Brazil with Dafici, in, um, uh, in, in Russia with La Moda, and also I think in uh, South Africa, um, and also in, in the Middle East. So that, was that, that business model is quite common now. I think for Zalando itself, right now, it's the, 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 the expansion outside of Europe is very, very invest heavy because you always have to provide such a logistics footprint, as you said, because last mile delivery in most of those markets doesn't even work on such a scale as it does here in Europe, where it's very easy to, to make sure that it works. And so you have to invest on a completely different scale in those markets. And that's why I don't, my personal opinion is I don't think that you will see it uh, anytime soon, uh, but I'm 100% sure that such models will work in those markets, but they have to be very, very um, individually um, uh, tailored. Thank yeah. you. Hi. Um, first of all, uh, really impressive. Uh, and second, I, I wonder in this whole journey, you, you have a lot of bold decisions to make. And I, I have a question on decision making in such a company, in such a setup that is really, really fast and speed and crazy and uh, 3 a.m. in the morning, as I mentioned. So um, I can imagine you modeling a lot and you have finance geeks and I mean, everything you can put in numbers. But wasn't there also sometimes a gut feel like if you have to cross the Rubicon or you shouldn't go there or it's too early or it's too late or something? I mean, you mentioned assumptions. I mean, this is not always just numbers. Can you tell me something about this, you know, fight between gut feel and pure ratio and numbers? Was that something you had or it was just, you got a good f model, you believe in it and you tick the box? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I always believe we have a value at Solano which says what you cannot measure does not exist. It's a very common value, I think, in many, many startups as it exists. But um, what you always have to understand is, like, all the KPIs that you can have don't matter if you don't have an assumption or if you have a gut feeling or a, an opinion. Um, so you can, you can measure yourself to death if you want to. And um, so I think, like, in that kind of sense, Zalando was always very conservative. I always said that to journalists uh, when they asked me about, yeah, that all sounds so crazy and growth and growth and growth. But I always said, like, in general, we are a very conservative uh, company. We are not a um, innovative company. We are not trying to, to, to reinvent the wheel or anything like that. We're just doing what we believe is very good for a very big market. So we have a market which has a volume of about 400 billion in revenue per year. And we do 4 billion of it, so we are very small, we can still scale it, and that was our story. But um, what, what, you, what you also mean is like, uh, what, what you're saying is, and I think that's absolutely true, we had, we had many kind of situations where we always had to take such decisions. For example, when we decided to become a fashion platform, that was a huge discussion because we went against everything that we discussed with investors before the IPO. And we then said like, you know what, whatever we said to you, it's not true anymore. We are now becoming a tech company. And I remember, for example, the guys from, I, I had a talk uh, in front of some people from communications a couple years ago. And I said like, yeah, we're now becoming a tech company. And they said like, what the hell? You guys were the ones who tried to argue the whole time that you would become a retail IPO and not a tech IPO. You had us convinced through so many kind of ways to become a retail IPO and now you tell everybody in the world that you are a tech company. How the fuck? And, um, and I think like that was also something uh, with Zalando. So we, we stayed always very opportunistic. When we saw there was a good uh, uh, opportunity in the market that we tried to use it and take it. Um, but I would say still in, 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 gen in the general sense, you don't see so many crazy moves by Zalando. And uh, I think that's also what, what stayed uh, as what became a very big success formula for Zalando after all. Yeah. 
So um, two questions. The first one is, did you choose your Twitter handle before or after you decided to quit Zalando? <laughs> and uh, the second question is, um, you have three co-CEOs, which is kind of interesting. Um, how, uh, why did you choose, or what, why did they choose that uh, to do that? And are there any um, good things happening by doing that? And what are the bad things happening having that model? So first of all, my uh, Twitter handle and all social media handle with Boris on the run has actually uh, created that after I left my uh, startup here in Berlin in 2010 because I was really running from it with lawyers chasing me <laughs> at that time. And um, so, so it has nothing to do anymore with my current situation. Um, but uh, and, and the second uh, question, of course, regarding the three CEOs, I think... It's a very unique situation, and it's a v it's something that's not very common. Um, I think it has a lot of advantages. Until now, it has only had advantages for the company because having three people that are very close to each other, that have, that have a huge trust among each other, actually makes us have three CEOs in the company and not just one who is just very limited in time and, and, and also decision making. So they are very well um, divided by their topics. You have Ruben as the CFO, COO guy, and now especially managing the Zalando fashion store, so the core product of Zalando. You have David Schneider as the fashion guy. He has all the relationships with the fashion brands all over the world. He makes sure that the brand um, relationships and also solutions for the future will work out so that like, for example, we're now working together with H&M, with, uh, with uh, Inditex, so with the Sara uh, mother uh, company. And um, then you have Robert as like the tech and strategy guy who's also still into the, the new products when we launch, for example, Salon uh, or The Lounge, which are new products of Zalando or not that new, but, but different products of, the, of Zalando. He takes care of those. So in that kind of sense, that's how they divide itself. I think... Negatively, of course, you can have always the point that whoever you approach, you get different kind of views and also perspectives. And that's also can be used by the top management to trigger decision making processes. But uh, to my extent, I would always say like it's great because they have a relationship that you always knew when they sit together, when they decide on something, they go out and they do whatever they decided on and they are not divided in their opinions too much. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, I wanted to go back to the former point that you were making about Zalando's transition from an online retail company to a technology company. Um, because you said initially you were not really looking to innovate very much and then you started to also become a fashion platform. So I wanted to ask if you can dig a little bit deeper on that. Like where exactly do you want to innovate now and what makes you a technology company? And is it really just being a fashion platform? What does it all entail? I mean, when you look at uh, the, the 10 largest companies in the world right now, I think six are already platform companies. Um, and especially when you look at Amazon, Facebook, Apple and, and many, many more, um, and especially Alibaba and Tencent uh, in China. Um, I, I always say like to people, especially here in Germany, they are all focused very much on the, Euro on, on the US market, but look at China, what they are building there with Alibaba and Tencent, with WeChat. It's just insane and it's going to blow our minds in the future. Um, but so when, when you look at those mega trends all over the world, you see that such a mono product such as Zalando would become very, very difficult in the future, I would say, also. When you look at something like Instagram, Instagram can become a big competitor of Zalando in the future. If your, if your front end is becoming the core um, place where actually the margin takes place in the end of the business, um, then Instagram can become the biggest competitor of Zalando. It can also become something like WeChat. And if you, if you look at those megatrends, you see that if we stay very, very mono, uh, in, a, in a mono style uh, from our business model, we would become also, well, we could be replaced in, at some point of time. So I would say, like, we, we always knew that we would 
be able to to get that to that step we have a lot of funding uh, through the IPO and also through our investors from from before and also through our profits and we can now invest it and I uh, think like when you, when you look at it as, as a tech company when we did our IPO we had 200 people in our tech department now it's about 2,000 um, and we did that in the last two years we opened up uh, offices in Dublin and Helsinki. We scaled our operations here in uh, Berlin very, very much, and we are hiring on a huge scale still. Um, but in the end, uh, I think there are there are many, many ways in, into which that that all could lead. And uh, but I think with especially with mobile, with the new front end that is currently the state of the art, which might not be there in the future anymore, but but currently, yes, it is. Um, so then uh, you have to concentrate everything on it and that kind of customer journey is also a completely different one than from the beginning when we launched our web um, presence. And so I think um, when, when you look at all of that, you see there's a huge need to innovate um, because otherwise other people will innovate the customer experience. And we try now to do it, like for example, geo returns in the Netherlands. You can um, just say with your mobile phone, I have my, if I open my box now in the Netherlands and I say like two of those three things I don't like, I want to have it returned, I just mark it on, in my app and somebody's going to pick it up wherever I am. And I think innovating the customer experience from that point of view is something very, very important uh, for Zalando also. And uh, the other thing that I also mentioned is like the connection, like um, I think gaining the trust of the brands was core in the beginning. So that if you look at Adidas, the new CEO of Adidas, one of his first calls he did in office was calling us, uh, our, our CEO and saying like, hey, we need to improve our relationship. We want to get closer together. Um, that kind of relationship is now very stable. So all the big brands are very close to Zalando. The next big uh, frontier for us are the, the offline uh, locations, so, so, so offline stores. Because Zalando is certainly not going to start building their own stores, but we rather want to get in touch with all the stock that is out there. And uh, if you look at the fashion market, roughly 90% of the fashion stock is still put offline. And we want to have access to those 90%. And that needs a lot of innovation because it certainly will not work that every store will take all their stock online at Zalando. I think we have to think about other ways to do so. And that's exactly what we're doing right now. So there's a lot. And if you look at customization, if you look at um, individual uh, fashion, if you look at, um, for example, also um, sizing online, there's, there are so many things where we have to also improve ourselves or we have to buy it through M&As, that's also something where we are looking very closely, but yeah. Hi, I'm wondering how did uh, Zalando manage company culture, especially considering its fast growth and the growth of the team? And maybe do you see any correlations to Zappos? Well, first the Zappos uh, case, I think correlations with Zappos, I think we are now four times as big as Zappos. Um, so I think uh, comparing us to Zappos is like, yeah. I don't know. Um, no, but I, I think in the in the beginning, of course, whenever you build a company, you have cases that are similar to it. And I think Zappos was definitely a case that we looked into at that time, which showed that usually you say, whatever happens in America seven years later works out in Germany. <laughs> That's like a saying you have in the digital space. You can say whatever business case works in the US, seven years later works in, uh, in, in Germany. And um, when you look at that, that was the right time when we kicked off Zalando at that time. So it wasn't too early and it wasn't too late. Um, so in that sense, Zappos helped us. Um, when it comes to company culture, I always say, I think Zalando has a very crazy and great company culture, but it's also through that growth that we always had our pain points. And if I think there's a great saying, saying like um, company culture is not reflected by the great... Um, pictures and um, billboards you post in internal communications with values and all that stuff. Um, company culture is shown by the people that you promote and that you, um, that you actually reward during the time of the company. And in that kind of sense, I always believe that was a key trigger for me. So I always had the 
the opinion that I would never have to ask for a promotion or looking into a new project and saying like, oh, I want to have that. Um, I always felt like the guys at Zalando always looked at me and said like, we're going to use you for that the best task we can offer you. And throughout the entire journey, through all those six years, I was able to do whatever I wanted and what not whatever I wanted in, in some, some kind of way, but um, in the sense that they always looked at what's the best s suitable role for, my, uh, for myself. And I think that was also something that we always did in our team, saying like um, trying to find that w where can you have the biggest impact for the company and f put you in that position and also make you have all the resources that you can have to actually succeed in that position. And that's why I think also in that kind of sense, Zalando was of course always very comfortable because we had a great funding and we were allowed to hire many, many great people and great talents. Um, I don't know how many people from McKinsey we hired in the years between 2012 and 2014. It was insane. Um, but um, yeah, so I think like in terms of culture, what, what is still also very, I think the biggest struggle for Zalando will always remain that it's three companies in one. So you have a tech company with tech people, with a complete tech mindset. You have a fashion company in it with a completely different mindset. You have like 80% guys in tech, you have 80% women in fashion. And the fashion people do not care so much about the tech part. They see Zalando as a complete fashion company. Of course, it's a fashion company to them. And then you have the people in retail, the logistics people, which are by far the greatest, the biggest group. Um, so, and to combine all those mindsets and bring their one culture, I think it's not going to work out. Uh, you have to make sure that you create subcultures in that great and uh, big company. And if you do not allow that, then it becomes very, very difficult. And um, yeah, so I think like um, it doesn't make sense to copy too much the Silicon Valley, but one of the key things I did in the last one and a half years was internal communications. And that was clearly something we didn't do well at Zalando in the beginning. So we had our, I don't know if you know it, but we had our first Zalando all hands happened after one year of the company existed. So very late. And uh, Robert, our CEO, always said uh, at that time he believed every, every second wasted on uh, every second internal communication is a wasted second. So I think we went a pretty big step uh, ever since. And uh, uh, we now have a social intranet where everybody is free to write whatever they want. Uh, we have great life. Um, like all hands happening all two weeks where you can ask the management whatever you want uh, with an anonymous questionnaire and stuff like that. So um, we invested heavily av after the IPO, especially after the business model became way more fragmented through the platform strategy. And um, that was key. Yeah. All right. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I think, uh, well, yeah, we'll just uh, <laughs> applause. Thank you. Hey, 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 hey,